go over the answers to the bell work, and then if you missed it, we're going to go over what we did and how we should have done it, all right? The first thing is solving. When you have something like this, you are going to solve method by factoring, right? So you're going to look and say, what's your common factor? My common factor is A. Um, take those out, set each factor equal to zero, and you should have gotten zero and eight, all right? So this throws people because you forget that when there's only two, you could actually have a common factor. Set each one equal to zero. The next one's a special case, difference of two squares. Again, solved by factoring r plus six, r minus six, and you ended up with positive and negative six. All right. When you're solving and you have a root, square both sides. What's beautiful about this one is zero squared is just, you know, zero. So you basically have the inside equal to zero. Um, and you get two, all right? For this one, it was a little bit of a trick. You did have to solve for z, but it is a greater than sign and there's a negative in front of the z. You should have subtracted the seven divided by negative one. That would have flipped your sign. So your answer here would actually be z is less than seven because of that sign flip. Yes. So for this one, when you factor this, or if you added the 36 over, remember when you take the square root involving a variable, you have to consider the positive and the negative root. Number five says, for what values of x is the square root of 12x minus 4x a real number? In order for it to be a real number, it needs to be greater than or equal to zero. So you could have actually set this guy up the same way you did um, three with just a greater than or equal to. It has to be greater than or equal to zero to be a real number. If it is less than zero in the root, you have a problem, right? And so you can just solve it, then you're gonna move your four x over, divide by your four, and you're gonna have that it is less than or equal to three. Less than or equal to three will make that a real number. All right, relations and functions. You have heard these terms for quite some time now, um, if you have had me. The definition of a relation is any set of ordered pairs. That's really all there is to it. They give you an example, set A. This is set notation, so you should also be familiar with that. Set notation has some sort of label. Very often it is just a capital letter. Sometimes it will be, you know, pairs of students in a classroom. Sometimes they define it a little bit more. But most of the time it's just going to be a capital letter when you're dealing with just straight numbers. And then you see you have sets of numbers, X and Y here. We have a first and a second. That's all that's required. It is a relation since it's a set of ordered pairs. A relation can be represented by a table, a mapping diagram, or a graph, which we're going to look at in a minute. The next definition on this particular page is a function. A function is a relation. So you're thinking of, we're getting more specific. Start with a relation that's any sets, then we're moving to functions. Specifically, the first coordinate has one and only one of the second coordinate. If you're talking x, y, for every x, there is only one y. For every input, there is only one output, okay? So I should not be able to put into a function an x and get two answers. If I were to look at bell work, for example, x squared equals 36. We, we, you know, that's fine. But if I were to do it the other way with a square root, you potentially have a problem if the x is in the root there. So then we have a possible input of the same, of the same thing to get two different answers. So there are times with when you have a square or when you have a cube um, and you can get multiple of an answer when you start going through and putting in an X. Um, and so functions are specifically one-to-one. -one. If you think of an input and output, it's like when you ring up your groceries at Walmart because like they have one live person and 27 you do it yourself registers, right? So we all know how to do this. Um, if you ring out the same barcode, you should get the same price. If you ring the same barcode and get multiple prices, we have a problem. We have a function problem. And so it should be input to output one-to-one. -one. Now, this does not mean that output doesn't have the same answer. The example is the square. If I have negative 6 squared, that's 36. A positive 6 squared will give me 36. That's still one-to-one. -one because my input to my output is one-to-one, -one, even though I have inputs that have the same output. If my milk and my eggs are the same price, that's not a problem. Input the milk, price. Input the eggs, price. It doesn't matter that they're the same. It matters that if I ring up the same bread every time, I get the same answer. So input to output is where the one-to-one -one lies. 
So they give you some examples of these mapping functions. All right, so you can set them up as ordered pairs, which is how it was originally given to you. Sometimes you will see it in chart form. You will see X is on one side, Y is on the other. You will sometimes see a mapping diagram. If you do a mapping diagram, you really need to label, just like here we have X and Y is labeled, domain and range needs to be labeled, all right? This is the input, it's going to the output. And then sometimes you'll see it mapping. Those X and Ys represent a point on a graph. So you can go to the point on the graph and see what is going on here. Now this particular relation, we have a little bit of an issue. It is not a function, right? We can see that a multitude of ways. I notice on my X column, one is repeated. This is a problem because over here, one can be negative one, one can be positive one. That's not a one-to-one -one input to output. On the mapping diagram, it's even easier to see. We have double arrows coming off the same do um, domain. When you have double arrows going to two different numbers, that means we don't have a function here. We just have a relation. And for this guy, we can see on the graph that you have um, two different x's that gave me the same y. Or, yeah, no, no. Two different x. One, the same x that gave me two different y's. I said it backwards. Now look at this next one. It's on the next page, top of page three. Same thing, we have a mapping diagram, we have a graph. You can see for every domain, there's only one arrow. Now, it doesn't mean that negative two and zero couldn't go to the same one, but coming off of the domain, you should have one arrow. And then over here, you can see that every X value is unique when it gives you a Y value, all right? Every X value gives you a unique Y value, all right? Questions on mapping diagram domains and ranges, all right? Use, I could use the vertical line test here as well, even with the points. So vertical line test is what you're used to when you see a graph. This is typically used for this type of graph, but I could actually... So vertical line test says that if two or more points of a graph function or relation stay on the vertical line, the relation is not a function. So I should be able to draw a vertical line through any part of my graph and only hit it once. All right, vertical line. And so you can see the difference between A and B here. A is not a function. Why is A not a function? Well, I don't have to draw the line. I have my y-axis that shows me it's not a function. But if I draw the line anywhere on here, I can easily see that I do not have a function, right? We cross it more than once. But if you look at B, um, I can really go anywhere. Now, you have to keep in mind, and I'll point this out because some people tend to think this is going to go straight this is gradually, gradually going to the right. This is gradually going to the left. So even though it looks like, oh, I could probably cross it here, you're talking about a minuscule amount of area, but it is gradually going out, not just straight up, all right? If you had a vertical line, that wouldn't be a function, right? But this is not a vertical line going up. It is gradually changing. They also talk about notation. We are gonna, we already did this at the end of last year, but you're gonna move more and more towards your function notation like they show here. Um, you have the F representing the function, you have parentheses, and you have inside those parentheses the input. So this is always your domain variable that's in here, your input. And then this represents the output. Whatever this equals is going to be your Y value. So I'm going to input an X value. My answer when I plug it in will be the Y value. And this is written and said F of X, F of X. So F of X, and it represents the function with an input of X or whatever variables in there. All right, they also show you down here at the bottom, it's kind of in the, hidden in the middle of that paragraph there, I just pulled it out. A function can be defined by its function rule and a statement of its domain. The rule is the what you plug it into. So like for this, the rule would be 2x plus 1. That is the rule. For every x, my y should equal 2x plus 1. That's the rule. If I were to say it in words, I would say you double your x and add 1 right? That's my rule that I'm handing to you. That's how you get to Y. So you can write it in this statement by writing the, okay, G of X is my function. Here is the rule of my function. And then you have this semicolon and you give the domain. The domain here is in set notation. My domain here for this particular rule is any X. This little line is set out such that negative two is less than X, which is less than two. So for this particular function, they are telling me you're going to get to y by this method, but you can only go from negative 2 to positive 2, not inclusive. What do I mean by not inclusive? 
So any questions on vertical line test? All right, I want you to try a few. If you turn to page six, I didn't put the instructions up here. So pay attention to your instructions. The first one wants you to graph the relation um, and state its domain and range using set builder notation. So you're gonna write the rule and you're gonna write the set builder with the domain. You do not have to write the range. Well, you can write the range, that's fine. You just use Y instead of X, Y such that. Um, they do not make you write the rule on this one. So just the domain and range and set builder notation. So X such that X can be whatever, all right? For number three, they want to write you want they want you to write this as a set of ordered pairs, and they want you to tell me if it is a function or not. Domain should have been kind of obvious, right? They didn't label it, but it's the guy on the left where you're coming from. So you literally could have just listed these. When you do the mapping diagram, they need to be in order from least to greatest anyway, and you do not need to repeat it. So they literally gave you your answer right there in your problem. You would have just said, oh helps to actually write my x in there. So x such that x equals negative two, one, two, four, or five. Those are my numbers. Range, that's the guy that's receiving, right, the output. So y such that y equals negative one, negative two, two, or four. Easy enough, right? For this one, it says write it as ordered pairs and determine if it is a function. So if I look at this, I'm gonna start over here at negative two. So this particular function, well, it's a function, but is gonna say negative two, two. My next one, negative one, one. He's a little hard to see, but zero, zero is in there. One, one is in there. And two, two is also. And then is it a function? Well, yeah, you could do it a couple ways. First, you can look and see every input has one output or you can do a vertical line test here. So yes, this is a function. So we'll get to just knowing it's a parabola and sketching it. This is actually wanting you to sketch it by using points. All right, the first thing you need to look at when you sketch this is the domain. If they do not have an explicit domain, listen to the words, there's explicit and there is an implied domain, all right? Which we're gonna do some implied in a minute. This is explicit. What do I mean by explicit? It's detailed. It tells you exactly what it wants you to know, right? They explicitly define this. Negative two is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to two. They are telling you the domain only goes from negative two to positive two inclusive, right? If they did not say that, this would be an infinite function. Your domain would be from negative infinity to positive infinity. There is no limitations naturally on this function. There's no implied limitations. But they have told you what they want you to do. So if I have an explicit domain, I am probably going to use my endpoints as some of my input values. Let's say I don't know what this guy looks like, all right? So I'm going to say, well, I want to um, test out g of negative 2 for sure. Um, they did like five points. If you don't do five points, you may actually think this is an absolute value because it's going to look the same. It's going to look like a V if you, if you do just three points. Um, so that's probably why they did the five points. So they did G of negative one, G of zero, G of one, and G of two. Now, why didn't they do G of five or G of negative five? They chose these because negative five or positive five is outside my domain, right? So when you plug these in, you're going to find that we have a three, a zero, a negative one, a zero, and a three. Is that what we got there? All right. So these values over here represent my X. These values represent my Y. You can write them out if you need to, or you can just graph them that way. You can go to negative two, and I'm actually gonna make this guy a little small. All right, so I am gonna graph these based on that x, y, all right? And so if I go here, I'm gonna say negative two to positive three, put a point there. Negative one and zero, put a point there. Zero to negative one, put a point there. Um, did they do positive? What, what did I do? Yeah, positive one. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, positive one, zero, and then we have two and positive three. All right? So because they did that instead of just the three, you can see this is going to curve. It's going to be a parabola. 
Now, normally with a parabola, I would zoom past it and put arrows, but this is an explicit domain here. So I'm just gonna connect these little guys right here and I'm gonna stop, all right? Now, had they done just less than or just greater than, you would do open circles. So if you look at the next little graph there, a chart, we start talking about boundaries, boundaries. In graphing, you indicate boundaries by open and closed circle. You'll notice that the boundaries on this particular guy looked like this, all right? Closed circle. The reason I have that is because this or equal to. Had I not had that, let's say those had just been negative two is less than x, which is less than two, like it was on the other page, then when I get to my end value, I can still plug it in to see what it is, but I'm gonna do little circles and I'm gonna draw all the way to that circle, indicating that my endpoints actually aren't included, but that is the boundary of it. That's one of the boundaries. It's just not an included boundary. So think of it as like the number line or equal to closed circle, not equal to, not with a not equal to, you're also gonna have an open circle, all right? So if you get this chart here, there's also ways to write interval notation where I don't have to write out X such that X is equal to blah, 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 because sometimes it's a range of numbers. That parabola was a range of numbers. It went from negative two to positive two inclusive. So I could write, it went from negative two to positive two, right, inclusive by saying X such that X is, um, no, I will actually write it with the two first so that X is two, which is less than equal to X, like they did it above, right? That's one way to do it. That's my interval notation. That's my set, set notation. Interval notation is gonna make it a little shorter. We have a graph, and in a graph, when we do it, we would do like closed circles here. When we do intervals, we are gonna do brackets versus parentheses. Brackets versus parentheses. Brackets are like saying closed circle. So I could write this guy with a domain of bracket two to bracket two, like that. That tells me the same thing the other one does, the set notation tells me. Brackets in indicate it's inclusive. If it did not include it, I would have put parentheses there. So you'll notice you can have any assortment. It can include both endpoints, it can include neither. It can include one or the other, right? I will say inequalities, right? Inequalities indicate it goes on infinitely. X is greater than or equal to A. Well, it includes A. Why do they have a parentheses around my infinity? Well, infinity is not really a set number. So I can't say it includes infinity. Infinity indicates by definition it's not bounded, right? Unbounded by definition. And so you'll never put a bracket at infinity. Ever put a bracket at infinity. Infinity and negative infinity are, by definition, unbounded, so you cannot have a boundary on it, right? It's not going to stop. This indicates it stops and includes this number, right? And so anytime you have just an inequality that's going to have an infinity on one end, one of your ends will be an open bracket. So this says write each inequality in interval notation, then graph the interval on the number line. I'm not going to worry about graphing on the number line. Y'all should know how to graph on the number line. Um, so... They have given us an inequality. We are going to write it in interval notation. So I know that I'm going to go from negative 1 to 3. Negative 1 is not inclusive. I know that because of the lesson. What am I going to put there? Parentheses. 3 is inclusive. I'm going to put a bracket. All right? X is greater than or equal to 2. That means X starts at 2, and it's greater than. So it's going to go from 2 all the way infinitely, right? And so it's going to start at two and it's going to go to infinity. All right. Does it include two? Yes, it does. Infinity is always a parentheses.
So we've talked about domain. Everything we've done with domain so far has, has been, like I mentioned, explicit. Then you get to these functions and they just say, what's the domain? And what they want you to do is say, is there anything implied that limits your domain? So when you look at domain, you start with the thought, every X works, negative infinity to positive infinity. That's your first thought when you look at a function. Then you say, what would limit negative infinity to positive infinity? Both of these functions have indicators that you probably have a limit when we are talking about real numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity. Let's look at the first one. What do you think is the limiting factor here? The key note that you're probably going to have a limitation. There's a, there's a symbol there that should indicate a limitation. There's a root, right? When you have a radical, you're probably gonna have a limitation. Now, you could have an, a radical with an index of three. That may not be a problem. We can have negatives under a cubed root, right? This particular one is a square root. Any even index has a limitation. What is the limitation for all numbers, indexes with an with a even number? Yeah, your limitation is anything less than or equal to zero, all right? If they say, we're talking about real numbers, unless they purely tell you, hey, include imaginary, which they never do for domain, then you have a limitation here. So then your next question is, well, how do I find it? Well, you know that the inside of your root, based on the fact that I want to stay in the real numbers, has to be greater than or equal to zero. So if I know that it has to be greater than or equal to zero, set it with that inequality and solve, right? Add your three, divide by your two. X must be greater than or equal to what? Three halves. All right, but you can leave it as three halves, all right? So if x is greater than or equal to 3 halves, I am good. Now it depends. Do you want it in set notation? Do you want it in interval notation? In set notation, it's going to look like this. If they say write the domain, your da domain is going to be x such that x is greater than or equal to 3 halves. If they want it in interval notation, then you are going to start at 3 halves, and it includes 3 halves because of that or equal to. And you are going to go all the way to infinity. X can be anything bigger than that. Set notation, interval notation for the same domain. All right? Look at B. B has something, a symbol specifically, that tells you you might have a limitation. What symbol is this guy? Yeah, we have this guy right here. Division is a fraction, right? Something on the top, something on the bottom, right? This is division. When you divide, you have a limitation. With the guy you are dividing by, he cannot be what? Zero. I can't divide anything into zero parts. If I start with a part, I have to at least have one part, okay? So my bottom cannot be equal to zero. There is a symbol for cannot be equal to, right? So we know that this particular one cannot be equal to zero. X, let's actually write that. A little bit nicer than that, okay. X cannot be equal to zero, or actually the whole bottom cannot be equal to zero. So X plus two, which means if I solve that, X cannot be equal to what? Negative two, which means every other number is fair game. If I were writing that in set notation, I would just say, well, the domain is every X such that X cannot be equal to Two, negative two there, right? How would I write that in interval notation? You'd have two. You'd have two, all right? So I am gonna go from, oh, I'm gonna go from negative infinity all the way up to negative two, but I don't include negative two. And I am going to union that, union set theory with starting at negative two and everything up to infinity why do I have to do it that way if it looks like I include every number between? I don't actually include negative two. So you would never write negative infinity to negative two, boom, boom. That doesn't make sense, right? That's all the numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity. But when you have, un it doesn't include that, you have to do it this way. Because I actually do not include that negative two. It is a union between those two sets of numbers. And so that would be my domain there in interval notation. All right? All right, my limitation on this is the same thing as the example. My limitation is that root. 
So I know that the inside of this guy has to be greater than or equal to zero, which means that my x itself has to be greater than or equal to negative four. This basically is my set notation if I do this right here. And then my interval notation is going to start at negative four. Actually, it's gonna be a bracket there. Start at negative four and it is going to go to infinity. Questions? All right, homework. Your homework is pages six and seven, one, three, nine, 11, 19, and 29. For this one, number one, I just want the domain and range and set builder notation. You do not have to graph him. Um, number three, you, they want to order pairs and determine if it's a function. For numbers nine and 11, uh, I also do not require that you graph the interval on the number line. I just want interval notation there. For this one, I just want the mapping diagram. So for this number 19 here, I'm just requiring that you do the mapping diagram. And for 29, you do not need to use technology to graph. We'll do some graphing this year on your calculators. I really want interval notation, and I also want set notation here. So for this one, I want set notation and interval notation for those two.